Hello, my name's Sam Ord. I'm an ICU specialist at Nepean Hospital in Sydney. And during this short lecture, I'd like to try and take you through how to perform a transesophageal echocardiogram. Now, TOE is an extremely useful tool in the critically ill, not least if you've got patients that are hard to image, but it also can give you information that maybe is harder to come by in transthoracic, such as looking at, uh, you know, in great detail, looking at prosthetic mitral valves or aortic valves, uh, looking at uh, the thoracic aorta, for example, and many other things. So it's a great monitoring tool as well as a diagnostic tool as well. And I'll take you through a few of those, uh, a few of those things that you can try and assess uh, for both of those. It's not perfect, okay? And one of the things that uh, I find most frustrating about TOE, I guess, is that the, sometimes the Doppler angles are not ideal. In transthoracic echo, you can go off axis to try and make sure that your Doppler angle is perfect, and some of that simply isn't possible with transesophageal echo. So both have advantages and disadvantages, and that's why they work so beautifully together. So let's talk, uh, let's talk about how to, uh, how to use the probe first of all. So on a toe uh, probe, you're going to have a few buttons on the, uh, on the top, which are going to be using uh, the omniplane, which are going to change the direction of uh, the way that the two-dimensional imaging plane is orientated. And I'll show you all this in a second on the simulator. The next big button that we're going to have is the, is the wheel that's closest to the handle, and that's going to be involved with anti-flexion, and retroflexion. And again, I'll show you this in just a second. The next button that's then furthest away from, or the next uh, uh, wheel that's furthest away from the probe is going to be doing the lateral movement of the probe. So that's moving it left and moving it right. The final one that's not on here is the lock. Now, the lock is a really important feature that, in my opinion, should never be used. The, the lock is a bar that's sometimes sitting just underneath that when you flick it on, it will keep a probe uh, locked in a full anti-flexion or retroflexion position. I think it's sort of used mainly in theatres if you're going to be leaving the probe in one position. The risk of doing that, though, is you forget that the lock is on, it stays in a, in a uh, sort of an angled position, and then you start pulling that in the esophagus, and that's where you can start to cause problems. So in my opinion, I never, I, I don't think that the lock should be used. I think you turn it off and just keep, the, if you want to have it in an anti-flex or retroflex position, you should do it yourself. Okay. So, uh, well, let's proceed with how to do a toe, first of all. Okay, so when you're inserting the probe, I try and follow the soft palate and the hard palate, uh, and the insertion takes a little bit of practice. In terms of learning how to do the insertions, I think you probably get the hang of it uh, after about maybe 10, uh, 10 procedures. In terms of uh, the, whole, the whole process of knowing how to do transesophageal echo, I think after about 50, you kind of get the hang of it, and you're able to so sort of proceed with independent learning from there. It's not perfect to be really good at toe. Obviously, takes hundreds and hundreds of cases. But just to be in a position where you are safe and you know an idea of anatomy, where you're looking at, and how to get yourself out of trouble if you get lost, uh, about 50, I think, is the number that I find that most trainees get the hang of it. Okay. So um, inserting the probe is. Uh, as I say, I use a bit of retroflexion following the hard palate, then a bit of anti-flexion to insert it down into the esophagus. Uh, I, I keep my, the pressure on, uh, the, the pressure on gentle pressure, asking the patient to swallow if they're, uh, if they're in that sort of um, uh, mildly sedated uh, situation, and ask them to swallow, and that helps direct the probe in the right manner. You never force the probe. Uh, if you're feeling like there's an obstruction there, uh, either uh, have another go gently or ask for some help, okay? Now as we insert the probe in there, there are various ways that people can proceed. The, my general rule is I try and minimize the movement in the esophagus as much as, as much as possible. But I also want to perform the procedure in a systematic manner, trying to make sure I get all the information I possibly can. And the same rules are going to apply as they do a transthoracic echo, that if I have an abnormality in one plane, I've got to back it up in another. Um, I also want to try and minimize the amount of movement in the esophagus, if I can, to avoid damage. And, but in terms of being systematic, I find that it's hard to do everything just in one movement in and out. And so I actually perform a procedure, the way I perform the procedure is I go to my deep gastric views first. I then move the probe up 
uh, all the way, assessing it as we go at both the deep gastric, the transgastric, the mid-esophageal and the high esophageal views. And then I turn it round, I then follow the esophage, and then I follow the aorta all the way down and bring it out again. So I do insert the probe once uh, uh, and bring it out and insert it again and bring it out. So there are two movements. Other people do not follow this. Uh, I don't think there's right or wrong way of doing this. It's just sort of what works for you. I think the important thing is, is just making sure that you're trying to follow it in a systematic manner. You can be opportunistic, obviously, and grab things uh, when you can, but just make sure you don't miss stuff because it's a little hard to go back and stick the probe in again if you've missed something, okay? So systematic, make sure you don't miss stuff, and I do it the same way every single time, and let me show you how to do that. Okay, so once we've inserted the probe in, I'm going to take off the bones now. So we're just going to focus on the heart. Okay, so first things first, let's talk about the movements that we're going to have. So the movements that are available to you when you've got your transesophageal echo, first of all is obviously you can insert it in and you can pull it out. What I'm going to ask you to look at as I insert the probe in and out is you can see that the movement as it starts to get down to the bottom of the esophagus and going into the sort of transgastric views is you'll notice how that the uh, angle of interrogation or that uh, the angle of which the plane is of the, of the ultrasound probe moves. So as we move in, it almost moves around about 90 degrees, and that's because the esophagus curls around the back to go into the stomach. As we pull it out, we come more cranial. As we push it in, we go more caudal. Okay, next movement. This is an important one. I'm going to ask you to have a look at both the angle of the interrogation here as well as the image on the screen. So this is the rotation. So if you have a look at my right hand now, as I rotate it round, it moves over to the patient's right. As I rotate it towards me, it goes to the patient's left. I'm going to ask you to also focus about my hand positions, okay? I don't have my hands really close together because then as I rotate my hand, actually nothing happens at the other end. So it's a bit like forming bronchoscopy, right? And then you in bronchoscopy, you have your hands nicely far apart. So that means even a slight movement moves the probe. If we go one way, it goes to the patient's right. If we go the other way, it goes to the patient's left. Okay, now let's show you about the movements with the wheels that I was talking about a minute ago. Okay, so we're going to start with the big movement, with the antiflexion and retroflexion. So antiflexion is that big movement, I may have come up a little bit, is that movement of that moving towards the probe. It's like if you imagine your hand coming towards you, that is antiflexion, okay? Antiflexion. And you'll notice, for example, if I'm sitting there looking at that angle with the left ventricle and the right ventricle sitting there off axis, if I do full antiflexion, in comes the aortic valve, which is a structure that's a bit higher than where my original angle of interrogation. The next move is going to be retroflexion. And if you have a look here, if I pull up and I see just the aortic valve coming into here, into the screen here, if I do retroflexion now, so that's pushing that wheel away from me, you see I, I lose that aortic valve, but what I gain in the process is I gain a very nice picture of the mid-esophageal four-chamber view. Okay, so anti-flexion, retroflexion. Okay, the last one, which I've got to be honest, I don't use all that often, uh, and I'll show you the moves that I do use it for, is going to be the outer wheel, which is going one way and the other. I'll just turn this guy around so you can see him a little bit better which just swings it from one side to the other, to left and to the right. And I find this most useful when we're trying to do the right ventricle views in the, in the transgastric view, and I'll show you that in a sec. Okay. Now the final one, which you'll use all the time, is going to be the omniplane. So this is this guy up at the top here, which says to zero angle, and that means that it's... Uh, uh, set perpendicular to the angle of the, the probe, okay? And as I press these buttons on the top of the probe, I can move that round one way or another. And just watch the way it turns. So I've highlighted here, so we've got on the left side of the patient, we've got the red line, and on the right side of the patient, you've got the green line. And as I slowly bring it up, look at the way it moves, okay? If I'm keeping the left ventricle in the middle of my picture here, so here I've got the left ventricle in the middle of there. I can go from my four-chamber view, so keeping it down the axis of the heart being the axis down here. Four-chamber view can become 
the two chamber view can become a three chamber view. And when we're doing transthoracic echo, all we're doing is coming at exactly the same angles, but from obviously on the front of the chest. So zero degrees, four chamber view, come around 60 to 90 degrees, and we get our two chamber view, come around another 60, to 60 degrees or so, to about 120, and we get our three chamber view. And we'll go through that in a bit more detail in a second. Okay, so those are the movements. Quick recap, we can move the probe. Up and down, cranial and caudal. We can move the probe to the right of the patient or to the left of the patient by rotating the probe. We can have anti-flexion or we can have retroflexion. Anti-flexion is curving towards the probe, retroflexion is curving away. We can have lateral movement, one way or the other, sliding one way to the other. And the last is the omniplane, which changes the angle of the plane of interrogation. Okay, let's start. So as I said, I start with my deep gastric first of all. It's not what everyone does. This is the way that I do it, okay? Unfortunately, uh, Bob the Echo Simulator is absolutely an incredible piece of machinery. The one problem is he can't do deep gastric uh, views very well. So I'm just going to show you the principle behind it and, and why it doesn't work brilliantly, but the rest of them is great. Okay, so in the deep gastric view, what I'm going to try and do is... Uh, I want to look back up at the heart. And this is a really important view because it's one of the best ways of getting the best angle of interrogation for the aortic valve. It's not perfect, but it's probably the best that we've got. And again, just putting, going into, here you can see the heart in short axis. What I do is I make sure I pass in the probe until it disappears and I no longer see the heart that's sitting in, in the piece. Okay, so there's the short axis view of the heart. Sitting in the middle here, there's the left ventricle and there's the right ventricle. I'm going to push it in until I no longer see it. When I can no longer see it, I then do full anti-flexion, full anti-flexion, pulling it round, and then very gently, I pull back on the probe until we start to get some contact again between the end of the probe and the stomach wall. And what we end up seeing from that kind of view, if you get it right, at zero degrees, you start to see the, uh, almost like a five chamber view. And perhaps I can show you uh, a picture that I've doctored just slightly. So over here, you can see that what the probe should look like. So as I've advanced the probe all the way in, I then perform full anti-flexion, and that brings that zone of interrogation or that plane of interrogation back up towards the heart. And it gives us this picture that looks a bit like this, where we have our left ventricle, uh, there's the apex of the heart, left ventricle, there's the LVOT, and there's the aortic valve sitting underneath there. So if you can imagine the angle of interrogation there, we get the best angle possible to look through the aortic valve. It very rarely looks as wonderful as, as this does, um, uh, but you kind of start being able to make out anatomy, and even if you don't have a beautiful 2D picture, you can still perform Doppler interrogation, okay? It takes a little bit of practice. Be really careful you're not doing this full anti-flexion when you're sitting in the esophagus, hence the importance of losing the whole picture and then doing full anti-flexion. And if you start to see a picture come back in, it means you've got contact with something, and just be careful that you're advanced and far, far enough. So typically that's around about the 50 centimeter mark, okay? All right, well, let's proceed with the rest of the image where we'll just be able to use Bob. So then after that uh, sort of deep gastric view, you can go to the transgastric view. So that means I'm a little bit higher, sitting in the stomach, but I'm a little bit higher, okay? And here at zero degrees, you'll see that if I've got the apex of the heart there, and as I pull the probe out, I get to look at the whole of that ventricle, similar to the short axis view and your parasternal long axis view. Uh, some short axis view and your parasternal short axis view using transthoracic. Here we have the left ventricle, trying to make it look circular. Apex, I can't see the papillary muscles. If I pull it up a tiny bit, I get both of the papillary muscles in there. The posterior medial and the anterolateral. Remember, we're imaging from the back of the heart looking forwards. And then we can come up to the mitral valve level. Okay. At this transgastric level, and at each level we're going to go, you'll see that I start off at zero, and then I start to make some movements. So at zero, after I've looked at those sort of three levels of the heart, the next thing I'm going to come up to is moving the omniplane up to 90 degrees. And what we can get at 90 degrees is I can get a look at a sort of the long axis view of the heart, if you like. Inferior wall at the back, anterior wall just at the front. Okay. Red side here, anterior, as pointed towards the head, excuse me. And so that means that this area is anterior and that area is inferior. So I'm imaging from the back of the heart, remember. 
Once I've looked at the left ventricle, I can then swing it over and have a look at the right ventricle. And getting a look at that tricuspid valve. We can put some color over that and see if there's any tricuspid regurgitation. This is where I can sometimes, if you, if you can, one of the views that you can come back down to at zero is if you do uh, a little bit of uh, movement with anti-flexion and using that lateral movement, and Bob doesn't do this brilliantly, this can help us have a look at the right ventricle in a little bit more detail. So that's when I do use that outside wheel a bit, trying to have a good look at that right ventricle. You can sort of see it there as I push it around one way or another. That right ventricle with a tricuspid valve comes in, and here's the... Uh, IVC, there's the tricuspid valve, and there's the right ventricle coming in. So it gives us an idea of the right ventricle uh, view. Okay. So zero degrees, up to 90, having a look at that left ventricle, and swinging over, having a look at the right ventricle. Next one I come up to is 120. And why do I come up to 120? Well, I want to have a look at the aortic valve because it's the next area where I can potentially get the best Doppler angle I possibly can looking through that aortic valve. And again, you're going to see from here that the Doppler angle is far from perfect, but it's the best that we've got. You've either got the deep gastric or you've got this one to have a look at aortic valve flows. You've got to understand that you're probably not going to have the perfect Doppler angle and you're going to underestimate the flows that are going through there, but it's all you've got, okay? And the same with pulse wave Doppler, we could have a look in our uh, LVOT there to try and get an idea of maybe things like stroke volume and things like that. Okay, that's the transgastric. Next one, the ones that you're probably going to recognize a little bit easier, and as I pull out the probe, we start to see the four chamber view. Okay, now classically, I guess when we're sitting there in our mid esophageal four chamber view, I want you to just have a look at this angle of interrogation or this plane that's sitting through the heart because it's not perfect. This is where retroflexion can be useful. So just with a little bit of retroflexion, you can make the heart look a little bit longer. Classically, the way that I do is I just keep, when it's all at neutral and I'm not moving the wheels in any way, I just pull it up until I start to see that aortic valve. Then I push my probe away, push my thumb away a little bit, and that gives me a little bit of retroflexion, and that's where you get your perfect Minisophageal four chamber view with no aortic valve seen. And that's where we can see our left atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium. Interventricle septum down the middle, interatrial septum up at the top. Okay? And again, just get an idea if you're doing this, just twist yourself from one way to another and you'll see how that moves that heart from one side to the other. Okay? Keeping those hands nice and close together. And when we're in this view here, we can use color Doppler, having a look at the mitral valve, tricuspid valve, uh, as well as regional wall motion abnormalities with our um, anterolateral and infraceptal walls. Okay. Then putting that left ventricle into the middle of that screen. So again, a little bit of rotating around. I put the left ventricle into the middle of the screen. I then start to rotate around the axis of the left ventricle, which I'll say is sort of down there. Put them into the middle of my screen, and then I rotate up. So around about 60 to 90 degrees, we can get our two-chamber view. Go around again to 120, and we get our three-chamber view. Again, color Doppler all the way through, and you can look at your aortic valve flows. If there's any LVOT obstruction, your mitral valve flows. And here we're looking at our anteroceptal and infralateral walls. Okay, once I've gone to the 120, I'm going to come back to 110. And I'm going to ask you to have a look about where my angle of interrogation is at the moment. So if I'm looking at the aortic valve on that side, if I then push it over to the patient's left, in comes the left atrial appendage. And just ask you to just to watch, particularly if I'm over here looking at the left atrial appendage, that's a little nubbin just in there. Here's the aortic valve. And here's the right atrium, okay? So just look at each one of those structures. Left atrial appendage, aortic valve, right atrium with the SVC above it. If I look over the patient's left, there's the left atrial appendage sitting just there. I then just rotate my hand around a little bit. In comes the aortic valve. It's not the perfect view for looking down it, but it gives us a look at it. And as I keep coming over to the other side, then in comes that right atrium 
and the SVC that comes in. Okay? And this is the angle where we look at what's known as the bicaval view, and we'll come to that in just a sec. So it just gives you an idea of coming from one side to the other, okay? Fanning through that heart from the left atrium, left atrial appendage, the left atrium just there. There's the aortic valve over to the right atrium with the SVC coming in. Okay, looking at the left atrial appendage, this is where you can have a look at color flow in there. I typically, I zoom in on it if I can. I put my color flow over the left atrial appendage. I turn my flows down, I'm looking at a low flow state, so I turn the scale down, and you can put your pulse wave Doppler in the gate of it to have a look at flows, and if they're less than 40, uh, 40 centimeters uh, a second, then you can suggest that maybe you've got impaired flow that's going through there. Okay. Same at this level, you can also then start having a look at your pulmonary veins that are coming in around there. So this is the cumulin ridge that we see uh, just here, and here is the inlet to the uh, pulmonary veins, particularly the left upper pulmonary vein. And I can try and search for that as best I can, and then you can have your pulse wave Doppler interrogation of, the, of that pulmonary vein. Helps tell you about left atrial pressures and whether you've got significant mitral regurg if you have systolic flow reversal or something like that. Okay. Okay, so what's next? I'm going to go back down to zero after that. I find my mid-esophageal four-chamber view. That's a good time to say, if I get lost, you know, if you do get lost, just go back to what you know. And one of the things that most people know is just the mid-esophageal four-chamber view. So if you get lost, just find that again, and it, use that as a fulcrum to try and help yourself go in the right direction from there. So I find my mid-esophageal four-chamber view, and I pull it back until the aortic valve comes into view. Put that into the center of my screen, and then I come up to 30 degrees. Again, these angles are just a starting point. Not everyone's got a perfectly orientated heart. Sometimes it does move around, particularly you get like tortuous aortas or you know, vascular passic, and the heart can get twisted around a little bit, but this is the starting point. So typically it's at 30 degrees. In there you see the short axis view of the aortic valve. Uh, Bob's not perfect for this view, I'll be honest. Normally you can see the aortic valve, you'll have a good view of the tricuspid valve in there, and you'll see that right ventricle wrapping round and the pulmonary valve, and sometimes you can see all three, um, you can see all three valves in the same view. It's one of my favorite views in echo, uh, where you can see all three valves in the intraatrial septum up at the top. Here's where we can start sticking color across the intraatrial septum, looking for things like patent foramen ovales or atrial septal defects. Color over the aortic valve, looking for uh, looking there's any regurgitation or obvious turbulent blood flow from stenosis, and we can look for tricuspid regurg. It's worth noting that if you're looking for tricuspid regurg in this area, you start and interrogate that with your uh, with your continuous wave Doppler, and often you're going to have a suboptimal. Uh, angle of interrogation. Again, just realize you're going to underestimate maybe the severity of peak systolic pulmonary artery pressures or something. Okay, looking at in short axis, you then go up 90 degrees, so from 30 up to 120 or so. And what this can then give you is similar to the, uh, the long axis view that you had in the other way, is the, from the uh, mid esophageal four chamber view. You can have a look at the ascending aorta. And, excuse me, you can have a look at this structure in a bit more detail, having a look at the ascending aorta. And again, if I want to see that ascending aorta in more detail, if I want to look at it further up, if I pull my probe up, that gives me a look higher up through the thoracic, the ascending thoracic aorta. Okay? And again, you can have a look at the arch as well. You see I'm sort of curving from one way to the other, look at following that arch all the way through. Uh, often there's a bit of lung, uh, a bronchus goes across there and so often you miss some of it so you can't see the whole thing as beautiful as, it, as you can in this uh, uh, sort of simulator where I've taken off the, lung, um, uh, the lungs from here. But you get an idea that you can have a great look at the thoracic aorta looking for dissections, etc. Okay. Then I come down to 110 degrees and this is where I want to have a look at this bicaval view. Again, Bob isn't perfect on this and what we'd normally see at 110 degrees let me just turn this picture around. So at 110 degrees, what I'm trying to have a look for is there's that bicaval view where we look through the SVC, the right atrium, and the IVC. Bob sort of gets it a little bit of a different angle. But you get the idea that it looks something a little bit like this, where you have the SVC coming in at the top, 
So there's the SVC coming at the top, the right atrium and the IVC underneath. And often you've got the left atrium just above it. And this can be another great view for having a look at things like patent foramen ovales, atrial septal defects. And the big thing here for hemodynamics, if you have a patient who is fully mechanically ventilated on eight mils per kilogram, ideal body weight uh, of tidal volumes, you, and they're in sinus rhythm, so again, it's not for, it's not for every uh, mechanically ventilated patient, but you can get it in uh, quite a few, is you can have a look through here at the SVC, and with M mode across it, you can have a look at the collapsibility with insufflation and expiration. And classically, they say if it's greater than 36%, that's a sign of being fluid responsive. And it's got some of the best evidence for um, patient being fluid responsive, looking at the SVC collapsibility with insufflation. Okay. The last one, if you, uh, if, if, if you find this useful, so you can have a look at your pulmonary so here's the right ventricle. This is the main pulmonary artery coming off with the right and the left pulmonary arteries there. If you pull yourself up nice and slowly, you can get that junction there. So it's useful for looking. And here's the junction. Bit of retroflexion. And there's the right So that's that main pulmonary trunk coming at the bottom with that pulmonary valve just coming in down there. So that's the pulmonary valve there. And then there's the right and the left pulmonary trunks. Good place to look for saddle PEs. Okay, so finally to finish it off, keeping it zero degrees, I try and find the aorta. And with that aorta, then I turn around, I just follow it all the way down. And you'll notice I'm trying to keep it in the middle of my screen and look at my right hand here. As I push it down, the, the aorta does move around a bit and I just try and follow it all the way down, okay, until I lose it, okay? When you lose it, normally around about 45 centimeters or so. I then try and optimize my image and then I look at it at both zero degrees and at 90 degrees if possible, and I follow it all the way up, looking for atheroma, dissection, abnormal flows. I follow it all the way up, rotating around as I go. Again, if I see anything abnormal, atheroma, things like that, I go up to 90 degrees and I have a look at it in long axis. Okay, if you see an abnormality in one plane, back it up in another. Pull it all the way up, and you can look at the arch of the aorta up here, with the great vessels coming off it, and slowly remove the probe. The last thing I look at is I'll always look at the probe at the end of it, making sure there's no horrible um, blood or anything like that on it, and that can be the last piece of the puzzle just to make sure that you haven't caused any damage. And that's it, and that's how you perform a transesophageal echo. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.